Hey, y'all, my friends. Welcome back to Tuesday with Tasha. Does anyone have a favorite color? I do. And my favorite color just so happens to be the title of this book. It's blue. Let's see how blue became the wonderful color we love in this story written by Nana Equa Brew Hammond and illustrated by Caldecott Honor winner Daniel Minter. This is a history of the color as deep as the sea and as wide as the sky. Blue, a history of the color as deep as the sea and as wide as the sky. The color blue is all around us. Have you ever wondered where it comes from? It's in the sky, but you can't touch it. It's in the sea, but when you cup it, it disappears. You can crush iris petals for a brilliant shade, but just add water and away it fades. But then blue appears in the strangest places, discovered throughout history in unexpected ways. As early as 4500 BC, diggers found blue rocks called lapis lazuli in mines deep below Afghanistan's Sar Isang Valley. Ancient Egyptians used the rocks mostly to make jewelry. Some wore them as charms, believing they had the power to protect people from evil. But with time, they found new ways to use this underground find. By 44 BC, many Egyptians, including Queen Cleopatra VII, were applying a bluish mixture around their eyes that looked like eyeshadow, made with ground lapis lazuli grains, plants, and animal fat. More than 600 years later, artists began painting sculptures, walls, and canvases with blue from the crushed rocks too. It was a royal pain for those who made the paint and so expensive only the wealthy could buy it. Since it was a luxury and in such high demand for centuries, scientists, merchants, and dyers looked for more sources of blue. Then on the shores of the Mediterranean, Central America, Mexico, and Japan, dyers found blue in the belly of certain shellfish. A Phoenician myth says a dog discovered the color. Finding a snail on the beach, the pup ate it. The snail turned the dog's tongue purple-blue, and from that moment, a new industry was born. Dyers had different ways of releasing the color. In Mexico, they pressed the snail's foot. In the Middle East, they cracked its shell. Then they waited for the blue to appear. Depending on the snail, the color starts out a milky white or brownish yellow, but once it's in the air and the sun, it quickly turns green, then reddish purple, and with more sunlight, blue. But whether dyers pressed or cracked, snail blue was hard to produce. Each snail released just one or two drops. Imagine how many snails and drops it took to dye a royal robe, not to mention enough fabric to fill a merchant's shop. Perhaps because blue was the color of the heavens, yet so rare and hard to create on earth, people around the world considered the color holy. In an old Liberian folktale, blue is explained as a gift that connects God to humans. In Italy, from the 13th century onward, some artists began reserving blue to paint the robes of Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Indonesia, some say special prayers to ward off evil spirits before they make the dye. In Israel, blue drapes hung in the temple King Solomon built, and many Jews still wear blue dyed threads called tekelet. For years, snail blue was the most popular color, but all along, there was another way to find blue in nature. In parts of Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Americas, a group of plants in the pea family grew. 
They were called indigofera. There were a few different ways to get blue from these plants, green leaves. Indian dyers soaked them in water, while West African dyers crushed and dried them. When they added ashes or urine, it enabled the dye to dissolve in water so it could bind to fabric. Since it was cheaper for dyers to produce blue from the indigo plant than from rocks and snails, and the shade was just as vibrant and long-lasting, indigo dye, especially indigo from India and West Africa, was eventually valued by most lovers of the color as the best of the blues. India and Nigeria became powerful centers for making and trading indigo. People made clothing, makeup, and medicine with it. Indigo became so precious, people spent it like money. In parts of Africa, some merchants used strips of indigo cloth to buy people and sell them into slavery. In India and Bangladesh, some planters tricked or forced poor farmers to grow indigo plants instead of food. In the United States, some made the African captives they had enslaved farm indigo, calling the plant a cash crop because it brought in a lot of money. In this evil side of the trade for blue, leaders and landowners around the world abused or enslaved countless people just so they could grow more indigo. From the time blue was found, scientists worked hard to make a blue that wasn't so difficult or cruel to produce. In 1865, scientist Adolf von Bayer began trying, and 40 years later, in 1905, he won the Nobel Prize for creating a chemical blue. Finally, everyone, not just the wealthy, could afford something blue. But it was always about more than having a blue outfit, piece of jewelry, or work of art. Because of its scarcity, mystery, and holy associations, blue was more than a color, it was a feeling. We feel blue when we're sad, perhaps because the people who had to dig, grind, and grow pass down their painful memories of working the mines or of slavery on indigo plantations. Africans enslaved in America sang prayers that sounded like tears. The songs were called spirituals, and they inspired a style of music called the blues, originally known for its aching words and melodies. We feel excited when something happens out of the blue, perhaps because the color was once so rare, a discovery that seemed to appear out of thin air. And blue is still considered extraordinary as it was once the color of royalty. This could be why around the world, blue ribbons are pinned for first prize. Today, dyers still use indigo to make blankets and clothing, and some doctors still use it as a natural medicine. Maybe because blue has such a complicated history of pain, wealth, invention, and recovery, it's become a symbol of possibility as vast and deep as the bluest sea and as wide open and high as the bluest sky. Well, I've learned so, so much about the color blue today. It's so interesting that it was once such a rare thing and now we see so many things that are blue, like even the lines on this page are blue right now. I love the color blue and I love learning about its history. If you love this book as much as I do, make sure you click the link in the description box so you can get a copy for yourself. As always, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel so we can keep reading great books together and learning really cool things at Tuesday with Tasha. Bye-bye.